in the scriptures, there are prophecies given about the first and the second coming of the Messiah. We'll talk about both comings on today's edition of End of the Age. We have a promise of two comings of the Messiah. The first coming was described by Moses. Here's the passage. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That's found in Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19. Moses, Israel's most revered leader and teacher, prophesied that a prophet like himself would someday come to the Jewish people. From that time forward, the Jewish people looked with expectancy for the appearance of what they called that prophet. Now, the Bible tells us that a forerunner would come before the first coming of the Messiah. Here's the way it all happened. A devout couple by the names of Zacharias and Elizabeth lived just before the beginning of the first century. Zacharias was a priest whose duty was to burn incense in the holy place. One day, while burning incense unto the Lord, an angel named Gabriel suddenly appeared to him. The angel announced that Zacharias and Elizabeth would soon have a child, and they were to name him John. The spirit of Elijah would be upon this child, and he would prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Zacharias and Elizabeth had never been able to have children, and by the time of the angel's appearance, they were too old. Because of their situation, Zacharias asked the angel how he could know that these things were true. The angel replied that because Zacharias had doubted he would be unable to speak until after the child was born. Immediately, Zacharias was smitten with dumbness. Now, six months later, the angel Gabriel appeared to a young virgin named Mary. Gabriel said to Mary, And behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That prophecy is found in Luke chapter number 1 verse 31. Now, the Bible tells us the Lord's going to give us a sign, a special sign. Mary asked the angel the obvious question. How can I have a child when I'm a virgin? The angel explained that the power of the Holy Ghost would overshadow her, causing her to conceive supernaturally. This would fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. By that way, the name Emmanuel means God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord himself is going to give you a special sign. Now, before all of this happened to her, Mary was engaged to a young man named Joseph. When Mary told Joseph what the angel had said to her, 
he thought she had been unfaithful to him and had concocted this story to conceal her illegitimate pregnancy. Believing this, Joseph planned to break his engagement to Mary. However, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So let's watch now as the birth of the forerunner takes place. When the child promised to Zacharias and Elizabeth was born, their friends and relatives exclaimed that the child should be named Zacharias after his father. However, Elizabeth said no. His name is going to be John. The relatives argued that no one in the family had ever been named John. They turned to Zacharias to settle the dispute. Now remember, Zacharias had not been able to speak for nine months now. He had been smitten with dumbness. So they turned to Zacharias. He asked for a writing tablet. He then wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke for the first time in nine months. All who knew about these events were filled with wonder and with amazement. In 2018, we've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries has continued to reveal Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. Whether it's through our broadcast or our online Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital, timely materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we have continued to replace fear with faith in the hearts of Christians around the world. As we move into 2019, we will see prophecies coming to pass at an even swifter pace. We will continue to see the preparation for a one world government system and even more media censorship for Christians and outside thought. Because of this, we need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast, produce materials, and be a voice in the ever growing censored media. To become a partner or to give a one time gift, visit endtime.com or call. 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 1-800-363-8463. Your call says you care about the message of the end time and the gospel to reach others. Please call or go online now to give your best end of the year gift. It will truly make a difference. Thank you for your support. Please call or go online right away. I have left a piece of my heart in Israel and her people. We would like to thank End Time for doing such an awesome job with our Israel tour. We had the privilege to rub shoulders with Pastor Baxter. He is wonderful. Helene from Australia. Join Irvin and Judy Baxter May 2nd through 17, 2019 for the ultimate Israel tour experience with a Greek island cruise. Go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 to sign up today. We're looking today at the prophecies of the first coming of Jesus to the earth and the second coming. Another one of the amazing prophecies about the first coming is found in Micah 5.2. It tells us that the Messiah would be born in the town called Bethlehem. Listen to it. When the time drew near for Jesus to be born, Joseph and Mary were presented with another huge challenge. Rome ruled the world during this time. The Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, made a decree that all people under Rome's control must return to the city of their birth to be taxed and to be included in his worldwide census. Joseph's place of birth was Bethlehem. However, he and Mary lived in the city of Nazareth some 100 miles to the north of Bethlehem. In those days, when travel was either by foot or on a donkey, 100 miles 
was a journey of several days. Plus, Mary was now nine months pregnant. Having no choice, Mary and Joseph set out on the long, arduous trip to Bethlehem. Little did they know that the decree of Caesar and their trip to Bethlehem was the fulfillment of a 500-year-old prophecy found in Micah 5.2. Listen to it. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Arriving in Bethlehem, Joseph desperately looked for a room to rent, but all was taken since Caesar's decree was forcing everyone to travel. Finally, the only possibility was a stable. It was there that Jesus, the Messiah, was born. That evening, shepherds were tending their flocks when suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You can read about that in Luke 2, verse 9 through 12. Well, the shepherds quickly arose and made their way into Bethlehem. There they found Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, just as the angel had said. After worshiping him, the shepherds returned to their flocks, glorifying God for all the things they had been shown. They also told everyone they met. Soon the news that the Messiah had been born was noised abroad. Not only did God appear to the shepherds, but he also appeared to wise men from the east. Being supernaturally led by a star, they traveled to Bethlehem so that they could worship the newborn king of the Jews. Then there was the priest Simeon, who was told by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple for the rite of circumcision, Simeon was there. He instinctively knew this baby was the Messiah and the fulfillment of God's promise. Simeon took the baby Jesus into his arms, saying, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I mean, these prophecies are so wonderful. Now, there are many more signs of the first coming. When Jesus was 12 years of age, his parents found him in the temple in Jerusalem disputing with the doctors and the lawyers. Jesus was answering their questions and asking them questions. All who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Then came Jesus' first miracle. He turned the water into wine at a wedding feast. After this, he opened blind eyes, healed deaf ears, cleansed lepers, made the lame to walk. It was when he fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish that men said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Remember, they've been looking for that prophet spoken of by Moses. Now they said, this has got to be him. Well, finally, the time came when the religious leaders became jealous of Jesus and they wanted to do away with him. The religious leaders immediately looked at Jesus' immense popularity. They filed false charges against him, resulting in his crucifixion. King David had prophesied about the crucifixion 1,000 years before. 
in Psalms 22, 16. Listen to the prophecy. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands. They pierce my feet. After being in the grave for three days and three nights, Jesus raised from the dead. King David also foretold the resurrection. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Really? Psalm 1610. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to many different people for a period of 40 days. He was seen by over 500 people at one time. When the 40 days were expired, Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives on the eastern side of Jerusalem. After giving them final instructions, his feet suddenly left the ground. They watched as he ascended into the sky, finally disappearing into the clouds. Then came the promise of the second coming. We're talking about two comings now. The first coming of Jesus, that's happened. But the second coming hasn't happened yet, but we're getting close. Now, while the disciples were still looking in the sky, they were given the promise that someday Jesus would return to earth. The event is recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, we were given many signs that are to precede the second coming. We're watching a lot of these signs coming to pass right now. Now, during his ministry, Jesus alluded several times to his second coming. Though the disciples didn't totally understand it, on one particular day, they asked Jesus, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's the famous 24th chapter of Matthew. Now, Jesus devoted the rest of Matthew 24 to explaining some of the events that would precede his second coming. He said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, Jesus said that one of the signs of his approaching second coming would be a multiplication of wars and rumors of wars. During the last three centuries, we have seen an incredible escalation of wars upon the earth. According to Wikipedia, there were six wars with fatalities exceeding 25,000 during the 18th century. There were 22 wars exceeding 25,000 fatalities during the 19th century. Then in the 20th century, there were 75 wars resulting in 25,000 or more deaths. Are we listening to the prophecies? Let's talk about earthquakes. Jesus also said that preceding his second coming, there would be earthquakes in different places. Over the last 100 years, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of epic earthquakes. Those would be earthquakes of 6.0 on the Richter scale or above. The following are the number of epic earthquakes per decade. 1901 to 1910, 36. 11 to 20, 26, 21 to 30, 28, 31 to 40, 40, 41 to 50, 41, then the next decade, 49, then the next decade, 61, then 71 through 80, 49, 81 through 90, 41. Now watch close, 91 through 2062. So during the first 10 decades of the last century, there was an average number of about 41 earthquakes, but 2001 to 2010, it escalates dramatically. In that decade, can you believe 425? 
So when the Bible says there will be earthquakes in diverse places, we see this incredible jump from an average of 43 per decade to 425 multiplied by 10 times. Are we listening? Then for this fabulous prophecy, the rebirth of the nation of Israel, it happened in 1948. The Roman armies defeated the armies of Israel and destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Jews were banished from Jerusalem and were then scattered throughout the nations of the world. The Jewish people were sifted through the nations of the world for the next 1,878 years. Yet miraculously, they retained their national identity. Now, God promised that someday he would end the exile of the Jews from the land of Israel and would bring them again to their own land. The famous prophecy is found in Ezekiel 39, verse 23 through 29. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So they fell all by the sword according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon that whole house of Israel and we will be jealous for my holy name after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwell safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them anymore there. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Now think of this, ladies and gentlemen. After six million Jews died in Hitler's horrible Holocaust during World War II, after 1,878 years, almost 2,000 years, God gathered the Jewish people back to their promised land. On May the 14th of 1948, Israel declared its independence. The next day, five Arab nations launched a war against the fledgling Jewish state in an attempt to destroy her before she could breathe her first breath. However, their efforts were defeated. Today, Israel is a thriving modern nation of 8.5 million people and is the premier military power of the Middle East. This amazing prophetic fulfillment is simply undeniable. And it's a sign we're nearing the second coming. Great Britain, Russia, and the U.S. will be the leading powers on earth at the time of the second coming. The Bible foretells it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 through 8 talks about nations which will be in power on the earth at the time of the second coming. The prophecy is written in symbols, but they are symbols that can be easily understood. Verses 4 and 5 contain the prophecy. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given to it. Now remember the lion, remember the, remember the eagle. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, remember bear. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. A beast symbolizes a kingdom or a nation. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So when will these nations in this prophecy be on the earth? Well, many prophecies teach that the Antichrist beast 
will be destroyed by Jesus Christ at the time of his second coming. That's located in Daniel 7, 11. It says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast, speaking of the Antichrist, he was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. At the same time, the rest of the nations will have their power taken away, but they will live into the 1,000 year reign of the kingdom of God called the millennium under the rulership of Jesus and his church. Verse 12 tells us this. As concerning the rest of the nations, the rest of the beasts, remember the beast are nations, they had their dominion taken away at the same time the Antichrist was destroyed, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. This proves that all these nations in Daniel 7 prophecy will be on the earth at the time of the second coming. When God picks symbols to represent nations, he didn't pick them arbitrarily. He picked symbols that would be used by those nations at the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy. The official animal symbol of Great Britain is the lion. The official symbol of Russia is the bear. The official symbol of the United States of America is the eagle. The eagle's wings were shown growing out of the lion. Then the wings of the eagle were broken off from the lion. America grew out of Great Britain and then was broken off at the time of the Declaration of Independence. It is incredible how accurate this prophecy is. God gave us Daniel 7 so we would know that these three nations will be prominent nations on the earth at the time of the second coming. A world government will be established on earth. The United Nations was established after World War II. It was designed to become a world government to prevent war. Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State under President Clinton, said in his article published in Time Magazine, July the 20th, 1992, in the next century, nations as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority, national sovereignty, wasn't such a great idea after all. So we have all these prophecies coming together. What do they prove? You and I on the brink of the second coming. Move Mountains with Irvin Baxter. This book by Irvin's grandson provides 30 days of devotion that will enhance your relationship with God and others. Authentic illustrations from early morning devotions at end time will help you find your purpose and eliminate fears. Commit to taking this 30-day journey and experience real life change. Get your book for only $14.99. Call 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com slash move. If ever people needed to hear the unvarnished truth, it is now. There are some subjects that are not politically correct to talk about, but they're urgent. That's why I'm grateful for End Time Magazine. If you're not a subscriber, you're missing information that will impact your life. End Time has a bi-monthly magazine that explains how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. You can get a two-year subscription for only $29. You can also get a bulk subscription and pass them out to your church. We have gotten reports that End Time Magazine has caused spiritual awakenings in churches when they see the prophecies being fulfilled right now. You can start your own ministry and leave them in doctor's offices, libraries, laundry mats. You never know if you might be responsible for saving someone who is searching for the unvarnished truth. That's what the magazine has done in many lives. Call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. And get your subscription today. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is so supernatural. The only reason a person wouldn't believe it is because they don't study it. The Bible is God's handbook for the human race. You know, when you buy a car, you get a ma an operation manual. When you buy a stereo or some other appliance, you get an instruction manual. When God created man, he gave us our instruction manual, the Word of God. David said, Thy Word, O Lord, 
is a lamp unto my feet and it is a light unto my path. Well, we're taking your calls in this segment of the program. There is so much to talk about. I mean, we spent the first half hour today quickly going through some of the prophecies about the first coming, some of the prophecies about the second coming. We're watching them come to pass right in front of us right now. I want to mention one more before I come to the phones. Uh, it seems like every time I go to the news these days, I see another article about the emergence of the cashless society. Now, all of us know that we're getting our checks electronically. We're paying our bills electronically. 80% uh, of all con consumer spending in America last year, 80% was done electronically. We're moving very rapidly toward a cashless society. The Bible talks about a time when every person will have a mark or a number that they will be used for buying and selling. It's called the mark of the beast. I mean... How deaf and dumb do we have to be before it dawns on us that, look, all these prophecies are coming to pass right now. We're very, very close to the second coming. Well, we're going to go ahead and get to your phones, get to your calls. Uh, let's go down to Georgia, first of all. Hello, Judy. Welcome to End of the Age. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thanks a lot, Judy. What's on your mind? I'm trying to find out um, Revelation 9, 4, and there's a couple more about the seal of God because I'm trying to understand, is that like also an implant, the seal of God? Because a lot of people have the seal of God, so I'm trying to figure out, the, um, you know, exactly what that is. The Bible says, Judy, that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And many references in the scripture talks about believers, once we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that is when God seals us. And also, you know, the Antichrist, he's going to mark his followers because the Bible says they will take the mark of his name. Well, we as Christians, when we're baptized, we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We're taking the mark of his name. The plan of damnation is simply a very cheap imitation of the plan of salvation. The first thing you do when you're saved, you give your life to Jesus Christ. You receive him as your Lord and your Savior. You worship him as Lord. The second thing you do is you're baptized in his name. Well, in the plan of damnation in Revelation 13... It says there that people will worship the Antichrist as Lord and then they will take the mark of his name. So I'm not sure I have all the answers for you, Judy, but it appears to me that the believers will be sealed with an invisible seal. The Bible says we are sealed by the Holy Ghost unto the day of promise. That's my understanding. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Judy. Appreciate the phone call. Uh, let's go to Virginia and Rebecca's calling. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, Pastor. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much. I have one quick question, and I will take my response off the air. Um, I know your stance on the timing of the rapture of the church, but I'd like to understand what the Apostle Paul is describing in Romans 11.25, where blindness in part has happened to the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, um, can you explain what is meant by the fullness of the Gentiles become in and how that falls on your timeline of events? I think I can, Rebecca, and your question is an excellent question. Um, we know that the final seven years will be when God turns back to the Jewish people. In Daniel's famous prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, it's called Daniel's 70 weeks. 69 weeks of years stopped with the crucifixion of Jesus. The 70th week of years does not start again until the Antichrist confirms the Abrahamic covenant for a seven-year period. That's when God will once again turn to the Jewish people. But when the Bible says he will turn to the Jewish people, it does not mean he has to turn away from the Gentiles because there was a Jew and Gentile church mixed in the first church era. There will be a Jewish and Gentile church mixed 
in the last church era. How do I know that for sure? Because in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, it shows the sealing of the 144,000 Jews. But then the very next verse, verse 9, says, After this, and I saw a great multitude that no man could number out of every kindred, every people, every nation, every tongue. And the elder said to John, What are these, John? And John said, I don't know. Tell me. He said, these are they that come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So this depicts a great Gentile revival during the time of the great tribulation. But it also depicts a great Jewish revival, whether the, the 144,000 is a literal number or whether it is a, um, a symbolic number, I cannot tell you for sure. But this seventh chapter of Revelation definitely depicts a great revival sweeping the world, both Jew and Gentile. So mainly the Lord turned to the Gentiles after the Jews rejected him as the Messiah. But did he immediately turn away from the Jews? No. Even though they crucified him and said, let his blood be upon us and on our children. And yet you had a great Jewish church in the early church for many years, but they were Jews and Gentiles mixed together. Because once Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says he tore down the middle wall of partition, making no difference. So today, if a Jew wants to be saved, they must be born again. If a Gentile wants to be saved, they must be born again. No longer is there a difference between salvation for the Jews and salvation for the Gentiles. It is the same plan of salvation for all of us. Now, that's my understanding. And then finally, Everything will culminate with the second coming of Jesus to the earth. And the Jews that have not turned to Jesus, when he comes back and lands on the Mount of Olives, the Bible says in Zechariah 13, 6, that the Jewish people will rush out. Remember, they're in the middle of the battle of Armageddon here. They will rush out to meet their Messiah. And when they fall to worship him, they're going to notice he has scars in his feet and scars in his hands. And Zechariah 13, 6 says, one will say to him, where did you get the wounds in your feet and in your hands? And Jesus will say, I received these in the house of my friends. All of a sudden, revelation will come to the Jews. Oh, so you're Jesus, aren't you? Now, they've been in darkness for 2,000 years. But now all of a sudden, that's when all of Israel will turn to Jesus Christ and that's what I see is the full of the Gentiles. And then that's when uh, he will then turn and all Israel shall be saved. That's the way I understand the scripture, Rebecca. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, let's go now to Pastor Green calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Pastor. Yes, sir. How are you doing, brother? Hey, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much. Great. I, I wanted to... Um, I know I've, I've heard you talk about the restrainer before. Yes. And I, I believe that the Lord has revealed to me exactly who the restrainer is. Um, and I wanted to um, um, share it with you. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. The, first of all, we need to know what the mystery of iniquity is. And this is from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Right. The, the mystery of iniquity is sinful humanity's ability to use their tongue to communicate with each other and unite in rebellion against God like they did at the Tower of Babel. That's the mystery of iniquity. It's the tongue. James 3 calls the tongue a fire, a world of iniquity. He says, so is the tongue among our members. He says, the tongue, no man can tame us, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So the mystery of iniquity is sinful humanity's ability to use their tongues to communicate with each other and unite in rebellion against God. That's the mystery of iniquity. The restrainer is what God did in that in Genesis chapter 11. He separated humanity into groups of, and nations that speak many different languages, thwarting Satan's ability to unite humanity into that rebellion, which he was in full gear of doing back at the Tower of Babel. And so that is the, that is the mystery of iniquity, the tongue, the, 
in this in this man's being on the world being under one language, and the uh, restrainer is what God did in separating us. It's the language barrier between the nations, and we know that wicked. Those are the three that I've mentioned there. Is the Antichrist. So therefore, we see that the, um, the the mystery of iniquity is at work, but it's being held back by the restraint of the language barrier, and is not it has not been able to operate in full power so that it cannot bring that wicked, the Antichrist, into power. We know back at the Tower of Babel, it was Satan's desire to. He, he, he had then what he wants now. He had a one-world government. He had a one-world religion. He had a one-world economic system. And Nimrod was being groomed to be the Antichrist, if you will. Uh, he was, his, his, his plan was to possess Nimrod and demand the whole human race to worship him. So, Pastor God Green, let's, let's cut to the chase here. Uh, so what is the conclusion of what you're saying here? The conclusion is, is that now the the Bible, the Bible says the he shall be taken out of the way. The, the word he is not in the original text, so the it's not a he is a what. The computer, the, the the at the invention of the computer and the internet has practically taken the barrier, the restrainer out of the way. It's being taken out of the way right now as we speak. So soon, there and there almost is none now. There will be no restrainer because it's been taken out of the way by the invention of the computer. You can now, on your cell phone, download an app or go to Google Translate and speak into your phone in just about any language and then tell it to verbally speak audibly out of your phone into a different language to somebody that speaks a different language than you. This could be done practically on any street corner in the world. So what is this saying, Pastor Green, what is this saying to you and me then today? It's saying to me, you and I, that we are very close to the second coming of Christ and the, uh, the, uh, the Antichrist being revealed. Well, I, cer I certainly would agree with you there. And so that, and, and I, I have this entire lesson. The law revealed this to me about two years ago, uh, in 2016. Uh, I've published it for the first time on this year on uh, Facebook. But I, I would love the opportunity to, to see you the entire lesson, let you take a look at it and see what you think. Okay, well, thank you very much, Pastor Green. We are up against a break here, so I'm going to have to let you go. Uh, you know, we are very near the second coming, however you look at it. Uh, we have another segment. We'll be right back taking your calls. In 2018, we've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries continues to reveal the Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. Whether it's through our broadcast or online at our Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we continue to replace fear with faith in the hearts of Christians around the world. Moving into 2019, we will continue to see prophecy come to pass at an even swifter pace. We need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast and be a voice in the ever-growing censored media. To become a partner or give a one-time gift, visit endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 800-363-8463. Go online now to give your best end of the year gift. We have a caller from Facebook uh, wanting to know, will there be Americans that will follow the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation? Well, you know, anytime you have a country of 325 million people like we do here in America, there may be those who will follow after their own devices. However, the United States as a whole will not follow after the Antichrist. We will be the number one enemy of the Antichrist. The Bible is very clear 
that during the Great Tribulation, America will stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel, protecting Israel against the Antichrist all during the Great Tribulation period. So if there are Americans that follow the beast, uh, they would have to perhaps leave America and go over there, or maybe they could, uh, maybe they will verbally argue, well, this man is a wonderful person, but as far as uh, taking the mark of the beast or the plan of the beast being implemented here in America, I don't see any Bible to verify that that will in fact happen. Uh, let's go now to Alabama. Karen is calling from Alabama. Hello, Karen. Hi, it's such a privilege to, um, to be able to call. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, my um, question is real quick. When is that big revival gonna happen? Is that after the Antichrist calls himself God or before? I believe that it will begin as soon as the peace agreement is signed. Okay. I, believe, I believe once they sign this peace agreement, which could happen this coming year, yeah. then there's going to be a real awareness. We just entered the final seven years. It will cause heightened emergency among the Christians who understand it. Then right. a year or so later, they're going to start building the temple on the temple mount. This is mm -hmm. going to produce another escalation of prophetic awareness because even people that don't understand the prophecies, they all know when that temple's built, something right. big is going on. So the revival mm -hmm. will begin to escalate during the first three and a half years. Then okay. the Bible teaches that the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices once the temple's completed and he will claim to be Messiah and God. This will trigger the final three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. And this is when the two witnesses sent by God will prophesy for the next 1,260 days, the next three and a half years. So it's going to start with the signing of the Middle East Peace Agreement, and then it will continue to escalate all the way to the second coming of Jesus. Okay, that's exciting. We have a lot of work to do, all of us then. Uh, we sure do. We yeah. certainly do. Thank you, Karen, for reminding all God of us of you. that. All right, bye-bye. And the other thing that all of us should be thinking about right now is are we prepared? Do we really understand the prophecies? Now in Daniel chapter 11, verse 33, it says, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to be one of those who understands. Now I'm not talking about just a general idea. I'm talking about really knowing what you're talking about. I'm so glad to tell you that End Time Ministries has the Jerusalem Prophecy College. And by the way, it's headquartered in downtown Jerusalem within sight of the Temple Mount. But you can enroll in the Jerusalem Prophecy College today it consists of 11 semesters or 11 courses, a total of 143 lessons. You view the lesson, you take the quiz. You view the lesson, you take the quiz. And if you'll go through these 143 lessons and you need to get with, you need to hurry because the time is closing in on us now. But if you go through this, you are going to be imminently equipped. You will be among those who understand and will be qualified to instruct many. Now you may be thinking, is this expensive? No, it should be, but it's not. We have put it down as low as we can get it. We only ask for a maintenance fee of $59 per semester. I mean, think about it. Most colleges are charging hundreds of dollars per semester, if not thousands. But this is the most important college you can attend on the face of the earth right now. So $59 per semester, when you finish that semester, maybe in two or three months, then you go to the next semester. So it's, the, the price is ridiculously low, but we did that because we wanted anybody who has the desire to enroll. So I urge you right now, just check it out. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com register, enroll in your first course, get started, but don't wait because we got to hurry because we could well see the final seven years start this coming year. And you need to be all the way through this course, if at all possible, when that time happens, that way you will be locked and loaded and ready to go. Uh, let's go back to Facebook now. And the person here wants to know 
what will happen before or after? And again, I'm having a little bit of a handicap. Uh, Sandy wants to know, will World War III happen before or after the sign of the peace agreement? I'm sure that's what she wants to know. I cannot tell you that for sure, certain. Uh, it must happen before the final three and a half years, but I cannot tell you whether it will happen before the beginning of the final seven years or whether it will happen between the, the time the peace agreement is signed and the time uh, that the Great Tribulation begins. Uh, now, there's not much difference in that time period because once the peace agreement is signed, then the Great Tribulation begins three and a half years later. So the World War III will either happen before the peace agreement is signed, which means right away, or else it will happen during the first three and a half years of the final seven. And again, I can't tell you for sure. Now, we've got just a little bit of time if you want to get on the air. Again, we have some lines open. The number to call is 877 end time. But I know the news has been absolutely full today of the president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush's funeral. And a lot of people have been saying a lot of things about him, nice things. Uh, he apparently was a very nice human being. He was surrounded by many people who thought so highly of him. But I was thinking about President Bush. Now, his presidency impacted me dramatically because I saw in 1968 that the Berlin Wall was going to come down and the two Germanys would be reunited and that would be the event that would trigger the new world order, the end time world government that the Bible prophesies for the end time. And I began to teach that in 68. In 1986, I published a book called A Message for the President. And I stated in that book that the Berlin Wall was going to come down, the two Germanys would be reunited, and that would mark the beginning of the new world order. I actually used the term new world order. Well, in 1989, while George uh, Herbert Walker Bush was the president, the Berlin Wall did come down. 20 days later, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, Mikhail Gorbachev, and Pope John Paul II met together. And they came out of those meetings 20 days later announcing the birth of the new world order. Now, we've heard little else since that time. So this was a big achievement. Now, whether President... Um, Bush fully comprehended of what he was doing. Not, I cannot tell you. I can tell you this, though. It was during this time that I was on an airplane with uh, James Baker. James Baker, President Bush's closest friend, and he was also Secretary of State at the time. And so I was on the plane with him, and I was right then writing a book on the coming Middle East peace agreement. So I asked to speak with him. After he ate his breakfast, I went up. We talked for about 20 minutes. And I had a full spread on the middle of the magazine. There were quotes about the New World Order from different political leaders. And so while I, when I walked up there, I had sent a magazine up to him. He was sitting there reading the centerfold with all of those quotes. And when I walked up, he looked at me and he said, what you wrote here is not what me and George Bush meant about the new world order. He said, we were not talking about one world government. I said, well, uh, Mr. Baker, I'm sure you're telling me the truth, but isn't it true though that every action that President Bush took when he went against Saddam Hussein, he first went to the world government, to the UN Security Council to get permission? He said, well, yeah, that's true. But he said, we have veto power at the UN Security Council. I said, well, I know that, but isn't it also true that there's a big move on right now to eliminate the veto power so that the United Nations can, be, can become a bona fide world government? He looked at me and he said, well, yeah, you're right about that. Uh, so I was thinking as I was listening to uh, the funeral, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Baker was there, and I remember the conversation I had with him a while back, and it all came back to me, uh, flooding back to my mind about the things that happened during the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush. Quite amazing. Uh, let's get right back to... Uh, the phone's now, and let's go to Pamela calling from Tennessee. Hello, Pamela. Hi, good afternoon, Reverend Baxter. I um, was reading um, just 
just recently, uh, moments ago, the ChristianHeadlines.com has, uh, they've got under a, a topic here that the Ark of the Covenant may have been found, and it was, they think it has been found at a, if it's the true Ark of the Covenant, it was found at a church over in Ethiopia. And uh, it said Bob Koenig, who is the president of Bible Archaeology, Search and Exploration, um, said a recent investigation led him to Ethiopia where tradition says the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments were housed. And, and it said they were taken following events described in the Old Testament. And then he goes on to, um, they go on to uh, talk about this, uh, how it is, influenced uh, possibility that the ark may play a role in the end times. It said in the in this and the verse that follows, uh, he wrote that Messiah's triumph over the armies of the world, what happens next is very interesting. Verse 7 reads, and this, this must be in uh, Isaiah, but it said, um, in, that pres- in that time a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin. And they said it was referring to the Ethiopians, occur- according to verse 1 to a place that, of the name of the Lord of hosts to Mount Zion. What might be present be that if brought from Ethiopia to the place of the name of the Lord, to the Holy of Holies. And it said in this article that only the future will tell. Have uh, you heard of that? Yeah, I have. I've read that article. This article has been recirculated several times over the last 20 years or so. There have been many people that have conducted expeditions down into Ethiopia to try to view it. Uh, strangely, nobody ever quite seems to get that done. Uh, however, I will tell you this. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 16, it says there will be no Ark of the Covenant during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that people will not mention the Ark of the Covenant, neither will it come to their mind. Why? Well, because that was strictly a symbol. The Bible teaches, you know, the the Spirit of God dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant. But the Bible teaches that God no longer dwells in those physical things, that, but our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. So we have the commandments of God in our heart. We have the Spirit of God in our heart. In the Ark of the Covenant, there were tables of stone containing the Ten Commandments, and there were also um, the pot of manna representing the Holy Spirit. So those are symbols of which we presently uh, enjoy the reality. So when it, I do not know whether they will find the original Ark of the Covenant or not. They have now built a new one and it's on display at the Temple Institute. I sort of think they will not find it, but as far as that story, I read it very carefully. It's really nothing new. I've been listening to this for the last 20, 25 years. So it doesn't look like to me that that's anything we should concern ourselves over much about because there's not going to be an Ark of the Covenant during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ because God himself will dwell with men. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry we've run out of time. Uh, Call back uh, here uh, on our next program. Nice to be with you. God bless you. This End of the Age brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 or visit us online at endtime.com. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook page.